Welcome to the Restoration Road, where culture connects with Christ. Today I have with me as my guest, a man without whom I would not be here, my dad. <laughs> Dean Verl Cruz is here today. Dad, thanks for being here. You, need, you did not need to say Verl. <laughs> Why not? Don't you, you know I don't like that name. <laughs> uh, I got that name from the doctor that delivered me on a card table. You were delivered on a card table? Yes. My, uh, uh, my grandfather and my dad and I were all born in the same house. And of course, my wife then, when she had you... She wouldn't let me do that. She wanted to go to the hospital and broke that trend of 100, 100 and some years. Mm -hmm. But the, the doctor's name was Archie Verl Hines. He's been like, what's the and uh, they wanted to name me Archie, which I would have liked. But instead, <laughs> my mother said, no, I don't want an Archie in my family. We had an uncle named Archie that ended up in jail. I don't want that name to remind me every day of that guy. So my dad said, well, what's your middle name? He said, Verl. He said, I don't like that, but let's call him Verl for his middle name. So that's how I got it, Verl. And then it was uh, Dean and then all the Ds. Yes, my mom's family was, her mom and dad was Lester and Lazeal. And then there was Lawrence, Lenore, and Luella. So she wanted all the same. So it was Dean, David, Daryl, Dennis, Dan, Daniel, and Debbie. And then my dad quit. You remember how Grandpa Russell said that? Uh, uh, <clears> yeah. I had five boys and each one had two sisters. How many kids did I have? That's right. <laughs> Everybody tried to figure that out. Yeah, they do the math. Yeah. Um, you grew up uh, moving around a lot, right? How yes. many times did you move? Um, well, I just would get to know the teachers in the school, and then I'd move. <laughs> but we moved probably five times in, in my grade school years. And did you, you grew up going to a bunch of different churches then, right? You didn't necessarily yes. grow up at County Line Church of God. Well, I was there the first four or five years of my life, and then we moved around and came back. And so I was at County Line when I was about, uh, I would say, 16, 15 in that range and finished up there. And then did uh, Daryl and David used to tell me that you walked down an aisle at a, at a meeting of some kind to surrender your life to Christ. you remember when that was? Or sure. There, there was a campground meeting at uh, the Cedarville Park, which is about 10, 12 miles from here. They put up this huge tent every year and bring in some evangelists. And of course, the kids would always sit in the back row. That's where I was. My parents would drag me there, and some of my buddies and us would get in the back row. And they had a minister there from Toronto, Canada, by Reverend Paul Smith, a little skinny guy. Man, could he preach. Unbelievable. And he would just reach out and touch you. And uh, I was sitting back there, and all of a sudden, it felt like he was talking to me, because <laughs> I think there was probably a thousand other people who felt the same way. But I felt that. and, and and the Lord motivated me, and, and I went up front and gave my life to Christ then. How old do you think you were? I would say I was about 17, 16, maybe like a sophomore in high school or junior. So when did you call your first auction? Before that, uh -huh. when I was 15 years old. Uh, I started, <laughs> my dad had to go to the restroom, and I'd never sold before, and we were selling out a grocery store, and we were selling jelly. Uh, so my dad said, start every jar of jelly at 15 cents. And then it usually sell for like 20, 25 cents. And if we had 10 jars, it was by the piece, take all 10. Mm -hmm. So he, he got about 20 steps to the restroom and he heard me say, I have seven jars of current jelly, five cents, who gives six? <laughs> he stopped and he turned around and he said, what are you doing? I told you to start them at 15, right in front of the whole crowd. And I said back to him over the PA system, I don't like current jelly. <laughs> and it ended up bringing 10 cents. He said, you know what? That's when I knew you understood values. Well, didn't some said. better say something else? Like, he said he didn't like it either. I don't like it either. Yeah, I don't like it either, yeah. That's <laughs> tremendous. And then shortly after that, I got to selling a pop cooler. And a man had a twitch and he'd go like this. <laughs> And I was taking his bids like mad, and then my dad stopped me, and he said, wait, where are you taking the bid? And I said, there. And he said, is that your bid, sir? And he goes, no. And so we had to start over, but for a while, we had a real good sale going. So uh, tell me about your senior year in high school, 1959, at Leo High School. You batted 600. Your freshman year, I saw it in the yearbook myself. You played basketball, you were in track, shot put. But Russell, Grandpa Russell, had been auctioning since 52. 
Yeah. And you had a conversation with your principal at Leo High School on how you could be active in the auction business and still go to school. Uh, help me a little more with that. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you make a deal with your principal that oh, if what? you kept your grades up, you could oh, go to Oh, yes, sale? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, my dad needed help really bad. Um, in fact, I was offered a tryout for the White Sox, and he wouldn't let me go because he said that was a terrible life and you'd make more money in the auction business. Time out right now when we're talking about sports. Yeah. You were a boxer. Oh, I loved to box. I could have been world champion. <laughs> what was your record? Uh, 66 and zero. You never lost? No, but I was knocked out once on my feet, but I hung on and the guy didn't know it. <laughs> I got through the round. <laughs> and did you... Or Bob Anderson. Did you box Bob Anderson? One time. And he was Golden Gloves champ? Yeah. And then he debates whether or not you won that, I guess. Oh, that was <laughs> an easy one for me. <laughs> yes. And then who did you, you box somebody at a... Yeah, there was a guy, kid fair? named Rex Allen. Well, that's a different one, but Rex Allen was a Golden Glove heavyweight champ. And he'd come out to my house and said he heard it. I was a boxer. He wanted to put him on with me and just kind of spar around. So we put him on, and I mean to tell you, he tore into me, swinging, banging me, and I thought, what in the world is he trying to knock me out? So I hit him and knocked him out. You did? Yes, it took him a long time to bring me around. My dad said, they're gonna sue us. What in the world did you do that for? I said, he was trying to hurt me. But no, they had, a, at the county fairs, they used to have boxing, and they'd take some of the good kids that were good and put them against each other. And I fought a, a Newport boy that had won a Golden Gloves championship here at the fair. Wow, and won. Or yeah, one or whatever. Yeah. Okay, so it's not just legend, it's, it's true, you think? I could have been champion. <laughs> I know I could have. I wanted to. I loved to box, but my dad said somebody will hit you in the throat and then you won't be able to talk. Which is why he didn't want you to do baseball. Well, he said that was a bad life. Back then, baseball players didn't make very much. Mm -hmm. And you traveled around. I probably never got out of the minor leagues and it wasn't a good life. Okay, so you're making your deal with your principal. So yeah, he, he told me, he said, if you keep your grades at a B or above average, he said, I'll let you off to go to all the auctions you want to go to. So my senior year, I made more money than any teacher teaching me. Are you serious? I'm serious, yeah. And, uh, but I was only there about half of the time. <laughs> but I kept my grades up. Uh -huh. I never brought a book home in my life to study. Do you know who started the fire in the library? <laughs> yes, but I don't want to say who it is because he's a prominent man here in town now. <laughs> um, but he is the guy that put the fire out. He, he put his own he fire out. He put his own fire out. <laughs> and the teacher praised him for putting the fire out. <laughs> I thought, he set the fire. So uh, you married mom yeah. in 60, I think. 1960. The year she graduated. Yep. If my girls are watching, don't get any ideas. June and, 26. And then uh, I remember... Uh, you built, uh, I wasn't there, but you built a new house. For, I think it was $16,000 for 1,600 square foot. Something, something like. like that. It was a little under 20 grand, I know. Yeah, nice little elf type ranch home. And um, it was, pro you were the youngest state senator in the nation at 24. Yes, let me stop about that house. Okay. We had a preacher by the name of Reverend Jeffries, and he was kind of a, oh, he wanted to know what was going on everywhere all the time. One time I come home from work and you were about four or five years old and mm -hmm. you walked up to the car and uh, you said, Dad, do you know who lives up there? And I said, who? You said, Jesus. I said, man, that's neat, Mitchell. I'm proud of you. And I was. I was really proud. About a week later, Reverend Jeffries comes over. I thought I'd show off a little. And I said, Mitchell, tell Reverend Jeffries who lives up there. And you look up there and you go... Superman! <laughs> I've never forgot that in all my life. I mean, I'm 68 years old, and I still remember how I was humiliated. And Jeffries looks at me like, are you nuts? What did you want him to tell me that for? <laughs> I remember something else in that house. Um, I was walking to my room. Remember how the end of the house was your bedroom, and just to the side of it was my bedroom? Yes. And I remember walking into my bedroom, and I saw, for the first time, I saw you by your bed on your knees. Yeah. And I asked you what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And you said you were praying. Mm -hmm. And do you remember what you told me why? Somebody had told you to do that. Or well, you... I think uh, if you humble yourself before God, that's probably the most important thing. I mean, I'm, I probably have sinned as much as anybody in the world. Uh, but if you read your Bible a little bit, you know, King David, I just read about him this morning. He wasn't... Uh, 
nicest guy ever to walk the earth, but he did have, I think, humbleness towards God and he had humility. And I think God sees that. And I feel if you get on your knees, uh, it doesn't hurt anybody ever to be humble before God and worship God on your knees. I don't see anything wrong with that. My grandpa did that. My grandpa Cruz did that. Grandpa Fred Cruz? Yes. Now, they were German Lutheran, the Cruz's immigrants? The Cruz's were the Lutherans, yeah. And then was it when Grandpa, uh, great-grandpa <coughs> Cruz married Goldie Gehrig, Gehrig that yeah. they started going to the Church of yeah, God? Yeah, Goldie Gehrig's were more the evangelical, and they founded the County Line Church of God, which back then was called Brush College Church of God, which mm -hmm. I loved because everybody wanted to know what kind of college it was. <laughs> and, of course, it had nothing to do with it, and I don't know how they ever picked that name, but they changed it because it was on the county line to County Line Church of God, and your brother's minister there now. Sure is, Dewey. Um, and it's grown to over 1,000 people. Yeah, when they went there, he and his nephew, Dane, about five, six years ago, it was 250, now it's 1,000. It's amazing. Yep. Absolutely amazing. And you go there. I go there, too. <laughs> um, well, in that time period, so you're the youngest state senator in the nation because you were elected at 24, and you couldn't serve until you were 25. You were liaison to the White House and um, uh, really a, a top political figure in the state at a very young age, a lot of power, a lot of notoriety. But in uh, 1971, after uh, Grandpa Russell met with the um, Chamber of Commerce, I think, about they were losing money on the annual Auburn Court Duesenberg reunion, yep. he had an idea because he saw all the uh, cars parked around the courthouse square after the parade with for sale signs in them. And that's Auburn's cards in Duesenberg's. Mm -hmm. Nothing there inexpensive. Right. No. And, and you decided to have the first auction, um, first annual collector car consignment auction ever held, and it was in that tent behind the Dairy Queen. I remember I was five years old, and I came with you to the sale. Yes, you did. Can you pick it up on our way to the sale? Sure. What, what we, we came right straight in on County Road 29, and we got up uh, about a mile, mile or two from Auburn, and we the cars were stopped. So we thought, well, you know, maybe there's a wreck or something. So we came over to County Road 427 and they were backed up again. And then I thought, well, it must be, it must be a train across the track. We'll go out down I-69 and go over the top of the railroad. So we went over on 69 and we just went a little ways and the cars back were backed up. <laughs> I remember I thought, they're going to our auction, bitch. <laughs> we're late. We're going to be caught in a traffic jam. So I pulled off to the berm on the right and just started passing everybody. And, of course, I got all kinds of hand signals and fists and yeah. fingers and everything. I but I made it to the sale, and it was started to rain. And there was my dad out there with a couple uh, people uh, at a card table trying to register bidders. And, and the Chamber of Commerce wanted to make uh, $5,000 because that's what it was costing them. So they drove just plain old farm green fence posts all the way around the lot. And then they took one rope and just looped it around the post all the way around. And the people descended on Auburn and they just stepped over the ropes and came in free. And they ended up collecting $7,800 at a buck a piece. And, you thought and the food, oh, there was at least two or three times that. And the food, they ate every piece of food in the grocery stores, restaurants, cleaned out the town. Didn't the owner of the Dairy Queen buy two new Cadillacs, or is that? Yes, he did. No, that's they, that's true. After it was over, he bought two brand new Cadillacs. He was smart enough to run to Fort Wayne and get more food. And then, what happened that day on the Duesenberg? Well, we had a Duesenberg that was bid to, I believe it was sixty-eight thousand. Ray Kaufman was the owner, and the high bidder slips my mind right now. And uh, we had helicopters fly in from Chicago and Detroit with ABC, NBC, and CBS News, national news, why I don't know, but they did. And the headline story on Huntley Brinkley was two fools met in Auburn, Indiana. One that bid 68000 a used car, and the other one that refused to take it. Because at the most, uh, I remember Walt Cunney telling me one time about what his dad paid right before that for a Duesenberg, and they thought it was the most ever. It might have been fifteen or 15, 20000 Around 15000 In a private transaction. More, right. Almost all of them were under 5000 weren't they, at right. that time? Yeah. So right. this was crazy. Well, what it was is I think antique cars, especially the Auburn Cords and Duesenbergs, were like an unlisted stock. If a person wanted to sell it, they uh, had to run an ad somewhere or they had to try to go to shows and sell it. If they went into the bank to borrow money on the car, the bank would throw them out of the place. You, you mean you want to buy tw borrow 20000 on a 1928 Packard? Are you crazy? Mm -hmm. It's worth $500. But what we did is took an unlisted commodity and made it a listed commodity and established the market values 
publish the reports of what these cars bought, brought. So then a guy could go in and say, I own this 28 Packard. Here, they've been selling for 34000 I want to borrow fifteen. The banker would loan it to him. Wow. So we made a listed security out of an unlisted security. And I used to have people come up to me and say, Cruz, you're terrible. I said, why? You took a hobby where we could buy and sell Duesenbergs for 15 grand. Now they're worth a million dollars. That's terrible. And I say, do you want to sell yours for 15? <laughs> well, no, I want a million. I said, okay, we made you rich. So you decided to uh, have the annual consignment auctions all over. I think, did you go to Cincinnati first? Well, after we had the one in Auburn, there were so many calls of people saying, can you do that in our hometown? We had literally hundreds, so we couldn't even run them all down. But we had a guy that called from Scottsdale, Arizona, named Tom Barrett. He said, I got two of Adolf Hitler's car. I got the rarest Rolls Royce in the world. I got the rarest Bugatti in the world. I got the rarest Mercedes SSK in the world. And he said, I want to have an auction. Well, I was at least smart enough to know those are big cars, so yeah. we went down and booked it, and it was even bigger than Auburn. Really? It was on all the news services all over the world. I remember watching it. I don't <laughs> think our color TV worked, and I feel like I watched it on the black and white TV that we set on top of it, and I Probably. watched the news that night. <laughs> yeah, it was in all the networks. It went all over the world, because at that time, you know, that was a long time ago, Hitler wasn't out of power, only about 20 years, so yeah. uh, they had it in China, South America. We got news clippings, we got big books of them from all over the world. Wow. And uh, the Hitler parade car sold for 153,000, I think it was a new world's record when you, when you sold that, and, yeah. and they would uh, run the siren on it. Did Tom run the siren yeah. on every bid? Yep. And then uh, he got so happy he got drunk. Oh. But right behind that, came uh, Hitler's uh, other car. He had both of them. And uh, that sold for like 130 to George Wallace's campaign manager. So that made more news all over because George Wallace was running for president and he's, he was a segregationist. And so the, when the, his campaign manager bought Hitler's car was made publicity all over. Wasn't oh very good for Wallace. Oh my, I didn't know yeah, that. Tanner was his name. That's amazing. Yeah. And I just saw him as about 85 years old uh, last March in Huntsville, Alabama, a year ago March. And he had Queen Elizabeth's car. He's about 80-some years old. And he came to the sale and brought that car, and it sold. Really? Yeah. So you, you developed auctions uh, all over the country. I remember you, uh, when I was probably in sixth grade, we went to Holland. You did an auction in the Netherlands. Russell yes. sang back home again in the Yeah, we, we actually had six or seven sales in the Netherlands. Stewie went. He was little. Yes. He got jet lag. I yes. remember that. And, uh, <laughs> that's bad when you get that. That's horrible. You feel like you weigh 400 pounds. Yep. Or well, in my case, 600. <clears throat> <laughs> then um, it was probably 77, wasn't it, when um, you were financing collector cars to the buyers and yeah. you had a bunch of them not pay? Yeah. And, uh, and then did you buy out um, the car expert, Leo Gephardt? Yeah. And then he and, and several other people started all collector right. car auctions as well because it yeah. looked like it was easy to make money. That's right. And so can you tell a little bit? You, you, well, you, about five of them went bankrupt then. Uh -huh. It was all, only us, and then all of a sudden seven, mm -hmm. and five of them went under. And uh, you ended up with a lot of lawsuits. And we about did too, yeah. yeah. How, do you remember how many lawsuits? Um, I had uh, uh, 1,300, I believe, and 86 creditors, lawsuits and people I owed. You had I little... used to carry the list with me, and I'd mark them off with a black felt tip pin when I got them paid. Uh -huh. You got almost all of them paid, right? You didn't yep. file bankruptcy. You nope. bought Russell and Daniel and Dennis out for a dollar each. And yep. you, you assumed the debts and yep. went they, on. They wanted to file bankruptcy. In fact, they laid the papers on my desk one day. Oh, really? Yes. And I said, uh, well, I'll just buy you all out for a dollar. But I didn't know they all come in with 30-page agreements. I assumed all their personal loans and notes and everything else. I didn't know all that. But I sat there and thought, you know, I'm in debt millions. What's another few hundred thousand? <laughs> Might as well do it. So we did it. So uh, after uh, I was in, I think I was about eighth, ninth grade then. And um, throughout high school, I, I had my senior year, we had the best basketball team in DeKalb history. You had a there great that, team. There was that good team in Auburn. Yes, and I, I never, I was on the road so much, I never got to see the games, but I talked to a local radio station into letting me sponsor the games. Uh -huh. And so they would put the games on the radio. Then my uh, niece, Shannon Cruz, uh -huh. would take the telephone and lay it by the radio 
and then I would listen to your games wherever I was. And I remember once I was in Oakland, California, and you guys were playing the sectional championship. I remember it very well. And I think the score was tied, and you were on the foul line with three seconds to go. And I'm up in the room jumping around, and you hit the foul shot, and I jumped so high I hit my head on the ceiling. <laughs> That would have cracked the ceiling. <laughs> well, it wasn't that bad. It hurt my head. It didn't hurt the ceiling any. Those were wonderful times. And um, I had a decision to make whether or not I was going to go play basketball somewhere. I won that Eisenhower scholarship That's to a right. private school. That was and then, a great scholarship. And then uh, decided to you go. You were to, the first person ever to reject it. That's, I forgot about that. That's true. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so I went to Indiana University, Fort Wayne Well, campus. I got to tell you a little bit about you. That's when I found out how conservative you were with money because I always say you squeeze the nickel up to the buffalo craps in your hand. But anyways, you, <laughs> won, that, that you won that scholarship it was worth a lot of money, 10, 20,000. And you come to me one day and you said, Dad, I figure that I can go to IU at Fort Wayne uh, for like $1,280 or something and it saves me 6,000 versus taking that scholarship. And I said, really? And you said, yeah. I said, well, you need to take the scholarship. I don't think so. I, my mom's the best cook in the world, and I can eat her food, and I can go to school. I can get an Indiana University diploma, and I think it'll be okay. And I it forgot worked out well. that I did think that the scholarship would actually cost me more money. You did. I remember you sat down and told me that. I forgot all yeah. about that. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So uh, I remember... Uh, you got me going right away. I got my, I was the youngest realtor in the nation. I think yep. the youngest licensed auctioneer because yep. you had to be 18 to be licensed in the states that had licensing. I, um, and then in 85, um, you called me at home one night. Susan and I got married in 84 and you called me at home one night and said, uh, Mitchell, guess who's coming to the Auburn auction? And uh, I said, I don't know. You said, think somebody you like. He's like your idol. And I said, Tom Monahan, owner of Domino's Pizza and the Detroit Tigers, and you said, yep. And you said, I want you to meet him when he gets off his helicopter. He just got permission to land at the high school. So uh, I remember I met him, and as we walked probably 100, 200 steps maximum to the auction, he started asking me about the most valuable cars in the world. And uh, I talked uh, to him about that Duesenberg I tried to find for Rick Carroll. Uh, that would be a, a million dollars, be the most ever paid Hi, for a car. <laughs> and uh, she yep. wants to be in the TV. Yeah, she's no dummy. And um, end up making an appointment with him during the Star Spangled Banner. And he, uh, he, I went up there and, he, and made that appointment to go with him then to Minneapolis where the car was. And he bought it for a, a million dollars, world record First price. car ever to bring a million, I think. Yep. And he took delivery at home plate yep. in yep. Tiger Stadium. It was awesome. Tom lived kind of in a fantasy world. He... Uh, he bought an Indy 500 team and won the race the first year. Yes. He said, what's so hard about this? And he bought, then he bought the Tigers and won the World Series the yep. second year. And he said, what's so hard about this? Exactly. <laughs> and other people tried for years and never done it. But you know what? Uh, he, he was one of the finest men I have ever met. And uh, Tom wrote a book. I would encourage anybody to read it. And uh, he, uh, he's a fine Christian man. He's building a university now. Ava Maria University down by Fort Myers, mm -hmm. Florida. And uh, it's, uh, it, he went out in the middle of nowhere and bought thousands of acres and he's working on it. Mm -hmm. He developed missions all over the world for the Catholic Church, uh, I think several hundred in mm -hmm. Mexico. And he's just uh, an outstanding individual. I really think my life was a little better in meeting him and I think you probably do too. I do too. Uh, he stopped by the auction podium once a few years ago and said hi to me right after he had sold uh, the company to Bain Capital for a billion dollars. Well, we had a lot of fun together uh, in the auction business, yep. and uh, there's a lot of ups and a lot of downs. Yep. And uh, you know, the show's entitled The Restoration Road, How Culture Connects with Christ. Mm -hmm. You've probably experienced um, more dings, damages, fades, rusting, you know, the same thing that we would say about a classic car as anybody's ever experienced in the world. You've, yeah. had, every, you've had almost every bad thing happen to you that can happen to well, somebody. Well, I'm a, a ridge runner, and that gets you in a little trouble. Take big risks. Yes. You, uh, you, I had you, a guy tell me one time, take big risks, shoot for the moon, and life's a lot more fun. But mm -hmm. he didn't say anything about the falls of the way down. <laughs> <laughs> that... I could see how that 
what influenced you? Because you're a pusher and a, you, you're a visionary. You see how things could be. And you, you leverage your time, talent, and treasure to, the, to risk it, to, be, to have the best return that you can have, the biggest return you can have. But sometimes the bad happens. You can be exhausted. You can yeah. exhaust the resources. One time I lost a lot of money and I was really feeling bad. And I was talking to a guy by the name of Jim Vaughn who was a good auctioneer and had a big operation. And when he died, it all went away. But he really had a big sale every, every month. And he said, what's wrong with you, Dean? You don't seem upbeat. And I told him I lost a lot of money. He says, cheer up, man. If you don't lose once in a while, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> and I never, I never forgotten that. It means a lot to me. If I haven't lost once in a while, I'm not trying hard enough. One of my uh, biggest problems is that, and, and you don't have this problem, uh, some people look at a deal and say, oh, it can't be done. And I look at every deal saying, how can this be done? There must be a way we can do it. And that gets you in trouble once in a You're while. You're a great salesman. While I sell myself. <laughs> exactly. I want you to, to look at the people watching today. Yeah. And they might be going through something really rough. Yeah. Really hard. I, I want you to tell them uh, what they can do to experience restoration in their lives. Well, I've uh, been in some pretty rough situations in my life. Uh, where I didn't even know if I could pay the light bill or make the car payment or mortgage payment. And uh, I find that uh, God is there and he always is there and he never changes. We're the ones that change. My brother David has a sign on his wall that said, commitments made in stormy seas are forgotten in calm waters. And if every person lived their life every day like they were in stormy seas, and live up to the commitments you ask God to have in your life, uh, we wouldn't need to be on our knees as much, but we don't, we're human. And so uh, I've made about every mistake and every sin anybody could ever make. But I feel like God's forgiven me and God's restored me. He gives me another opportunity no matter how many times that I fail. So wherever you are today, we invite you to say to the restorer, I can't, you can. I can't free myself from the penalty of sin, God in Christ, you can. I can't free myself from the power of sin, God in Christ, you can. Dad, thanks for being with us. It doesn't seem like 30 minutes. <laughs>